What's the worst mistake you ever made? Story 1 I got stuck on my balcony before work one morning. The door latched as I shut it, was approximately 6 feet off of the ground, so I decided to jump off, landed on my feet, the grass was wet, and my feet slipped. Fractured 3 vertebrae and spent 9 months in a hospital bed. Glad you're okay. That reminded me of something that happened probably 10 years ago. A co-worker had to leave work early because she was worried about her husband. She hadn't heard from him all day and his work said he never showed up. He had some crazy stuff going on at the time. I think his dad had just passed away and he also had recent issues with alcohol and recurring bouts of depression. So, of course, she was worried about the worst that could have happened. So she rushes home to find his car still in the parking space and his keys and phone still on the counter. She calls out his name and nothing. Heart pounding, she searches the apartment and still nothing. As she's standing there in the kitchen in tears trying to decide if 911 should be the next call, she sees him lying out on the balcony in his underwear. The dude stepped out for a smoke with his morning coffee and the door latched behind him. He was wearing shorts and a shirt, but when no one heard his calls for help from the 20th floor balcony downtown, he tried throwing his clothes down to get someone's attention. Their balcony faced east, and he got that scorching morning sun at the beginning of summer. Poor guy was sunburnt to a crisp and had taken a dump in his coffee cup. I got drunk one night and decided to walk home from the bar since it was a fairly close place and I knew I'd had enough. Stepped into a pothole at a funny angle and down I went, limped home assuming it was just a sprain. Two surgeries, three months of rehab, and six months of not walking later, I'll never be able to run and I'll have constant pain from walking for the rest of my life. A similar thing happened to my niece, who is not an intelligent individual. She was at a boy's house she wasn't supposed to be at. The kid's mom came home and she decided to sneak out in order to not get in trouble and decided that out the second story window was the way to do it. So she tied two sheets together and hung it out the window so that she could scale it down. Two main problems. One, she is a heavier girl and doesn't have the strength to accomplish this feat. And two, she neglected to tie the other end to anything at all. Apparently she just set a corner of the bed on the end of it. She grabs the sheet and tries to descend, and descend she did. She landed on her ass and broke her coccyx, along with a few other vertebral fractures. I went to go do some work on a crappy rental house while the tenants were out of town. I went into a second floor bedroom to clean the carpet and shut the door to get the carpet behind it. When I went to leave, the knob broke off the door. Long story short, there was literally no way out of that bedroom. The windows were painted shut, and my phone was in another room. I lay on that floor for 16 hours before my wife came looking for me. I spent an hour trying to kick that door down, but it was solid wood and opened into the room. It's such a strange feeling being completely trapped. I had a friend slash coworker who needed to grab something from a shipping container on our way out. So the rest of us waited in the truck and waited and waited for like five to 10 minutes until someone finally opted to check on him. He started to open the garage door where he looked up at a spider with babies that leaped down on him. Panicked, he jumped into the dark garage door which slammed shut behind him, locking him in the room with nothing but a herd of spiders and his imagination. Story two, talking to the police without a lawyer. Don't do that kids. I took a legal class where they told us about a hairdresser who was being stalked by her ex. When she left work after dark, she slipped a pair of shearing scissors into her coat pocket just in case, because her ex had ambushed her in the parking lot of her apartment complex before. On the way home, she was pulled over. The officer noticed the handle of the scissors poking out and asked what they were. She explained they were precautionary in case her ex attacked her again. She was arrested for having a concealed weapon that she failed to notify the officer about. Because she intended to use the scissors as a weapon, legally, they were a weapon. If she had just said the scissors were from work, and she accidentally left them in her pocket, they wouldn't have been considered a weapon, and she would have been fine. 
There was a case where a woman went to pick her 14-year-old son up from school and was greeted by a police officer who told her there had been some vandalism, and they were questioning a couple of kids who may have seen something. He asked if it would be okay to question her son, and she okayed it. Several minutes later, she saw her son's teacher and asked where the vandalism was. The teacher said he didn't know about any vandalism. She found out a girl was accusing her son of rape, and the police were questioning him about it. abso freaking lutely I got hugely screwed over on this. I reported a sick guy for posting CP stuff online to the police. Asked what I was doing looking at it. Explained it was on freaking Facebook not the dark web, and I stumbled across it. At that point, I should have asked for a lawyer. Apparently, I shouldn't go on Facebook if that's what is in there. I said I shouldn't drive on a freaking motorway in case I saw an accident then. Maybe telling them to get a freaking grip wasn't the best move. Took 18 months of my life and a judge 15 seconds. Why is Mr. Snaggletooth here? I am not bringing in the jury, and the case has no merit. Honestly, screw the police. I literally wouldn't give them the time of day without legal representation being present. That reminds me of those police that showed up to those parents' homes and asked for help with their 11-year-old daughter who was being solicited for pics by an old creepy pervert on the internet. Then, the police attempted to arrest the kid for distributing CP, kept saying she should be charged. It was so unbelievably messed up, any person with half a working brain cell could see that. It was so heinous. Yes, even if you're innocent, get a lawyer. You can still get arrested for a crime you didn't commit, and the less you say, the easier it is to get you out of that predicament. I'm invoking my Fifth Amendment right to silence and requesting also my right to an attorney, or something of that nature. Also, in the US, police are allowed to lie to you. Just because they say that your partner told them everything, or they have tons of evidence against you, doesn't mean that what they're saying is true. Don't get scared and say something you regret. If they say, can I search your XYZ, the answer is always no. If they're asking, that usually indicates they don't have a warrant or probable cause. Those things would allow them to search without your permission, and you can literally just say no. Even if you have nothing to hide, say no. I'm not an attorney, just the family. So this is not legal advice, but it's kept me from getting in trouble enough times when I was a troublemaker. There is never a situation where talking with the police without a lawyer will benefit you. You will never get a better deal. The police aren't there to work things out with you. The police have one mission, to collect evidence of crimes and build a case to prosecute someone. Who they prosecute and what they prosecute them for is irrelevant. They are out to charge and prosecute anybody and everybody with every crime possible. Everything you say is you doing their job for them, whether you're innocent or guilty. Not answering questions without a lawyer or at all is your right. It can never be held against you. However, anything you say can and will be held against you. If you think that means something other than exactly what it says, you're in trouble. Say it immediately. I respectfully decline to answer your questions or make any statements without an attorney present. You don't have to be under arrest to exercise your constitutional rights. Some cops are morons. My brother and I almost got run over on the street by some idiot who was our neighbor and had it against my brother. Whenever he'd see one of our cars, he would speed and try to cut us off or sidestep us to go off the road. One time he almost hit my brother because the guy was going against traffic on a one lane road to try to get my brother to go to, into a ditch. So my brother sped up to avoid going off road and being hit. I'm telling you, this guy was being reckless and idiotic. I had been recording at that time and caught him tailgating us when he sped up on a one-lane street. When I tried reporting him, the police looked me straight in the eye and said, I can have your brother arrested for speeding recklessly with this video. Completely ignored the guy going against traffic, coming inches from our car, honking and tailgating. Story 3. The dorky guy in our graphics lab at school was trying to convince us to buy Apple stock as we struggled with our POS PowerPC 6300s. No man, they're rehiring the CEO they fired. He started the company. He's like, visionary. He's gonna resurrect them. My husband is forever pissed at his mom for not getting him stock in Google on his 13th birthday like he asked for. 
Apparently her response was the internet is just a fad. So she bought him a skateboard or something. My dad still talks about how his friends tried to convince him to invest in some expensive coffee shop. My dad said it was dumb since no one wanted a $3 cup of coffee they could make at home. It was Starbucks in the early 90s. Ha! I was in Kuwait with the army during the thick of COVID. With 8 hour time difference. We couldn't go anywhere and the only open indoor facilities were the dining hall and department store. I was following rumblings about short squeezes and game stops, and the cult of deep value. I thought, nah, I'll dump 15000 into an ETF that hit its peak instead. Fortunately for me, I invested in the AMC Aftershock and recouped my losses. I have a buddy who got really into Bitcoin back when it first came out. He kept encouraging me to do some mining back then, when it was easy and fast without special hardware, but I never did. I could be a millionaire now if I had. As for my friend, he moved on after a couple of years and cashed out when Bitcoin hit $1. He didn't get rich, but it was enough for a new computer and a down payment on a nice car. He still kicks himself for not saving any though. Eh, I knew about Bitcoin when it was cheap and it seemed like a waste. I could see why some people were into it, but it wasn't like it is today. I never would have thought it would explode in value. Could I have been retired if I had taken my coworker seriously when he told me about it? Sure. It's probably why he owns such a nice big house, despite only being 32 years old. But it's one of those things that was a gamble to invest in and there was no way to know it'd be where it is today. My wealthy grandma died when I was in high school and left each of us grandkids 10,000 in mutual funds. I convinced my dad to sell mine and YOLO to Apple because the news had just come out that they were ditching PowerPC and moving to Intel CPUs, which seemed very bullish to my nerd ass. I sold all of it to buy a Nissan Maxima about six weeks before the original iPhone was announced. I've reluctantly done the math on what it would be worth today and its millions. I had a psycho marine friend when I was in the Air Force who turned me onto Bitcoin around 2010. I had hundreds and spent them on Minecraft server hosting and meme stuff like ordering pizzas. Then I lost my wallet while it was still only worth a few hundred bucks. Again, millions today. Runner up, I had 5k of Nvidia in 2020 and traded it for GME. That one I can live with because I've made plenty of money from GME over the years. But had I left it alone, it would be worth 1 to 200k today. It's taught me one lesson. Always buy, never sell. And if you do sell, never sell the majority of your position. Trickle some out with the promise to yourself that you're going to replace those shares when you can afford it. Story 4. I skipped a class for organic chemistry in college before finals. Didn't get the memo that final exams would be given in a different room. Showed up 45 minutes late and my professor wouldn't let me in. I failed the class and nearly failed out of college that semester. I was on academic probation after that. Something similar happened to my son this spring. His college algebra class was online. He assumed his final would also be online. He found out too late that it was in person. Showed up about 40 minutes late and wasn't allowed to take the test. He emailed his teacher immediately and she ignored him. Got an F in the class when he did have an A previously. Now he gets to pay to retake the class. That's so messed up. The professor absolutely could have been accommodating and instead was vindictive. Nothing worse than an educator on a power trip. I was super depressed and didn't know how to get treatment in college. I missed half of a couple of my classes and both professors let it slide because my grades, when I was able to get out of bed, were good and they understood. My senior year, I had to stay home an extra week after spring break to go to court for a traffic ticket. I let the professor know ahead of time, missed one class, and the professor wouldn't let it slide. I had to stay on campus for an extra month to take an online grant writing class so I could technically graduate in the fall. She was a bitch. Thankfully, I was still able to walk with my class in the spring. My dad had a professor refuse to let him take a surprise test he missed because he was with my mom while she had a miscarriage. The professor told him he couldn't let him take the test because you wouldn't respect me if I did. My dad still does not respect him. 
This happened to me, except my professor was nicer, luckily. I attended every single lecture, and I'm not sure how or why I missed the fact that finals were online on a certain day. I went to class on the normal day it usually was and there was no one there. I was so confused because it was finals week. I looked online and saw that the final was online the night before, due by 10 p.m. I was shocked and emailed the teacher. Honestly, the only reason she let me take it despite it being a day later was because I told her I hadn't missed any of her lectures, and it was an honest mistake. So she took pity? That's honestly crappy on the professor's part. What if you hadn't just skipped the class and had been really sick, or had a family emergency or something? What if you had never missed a class in your life before or since? You were just SOL because the professor chose not to make any kind of announcement via email or even a note on the regular classroom door, and then failed people because they made that choice? Absurd. I had that happen to me in my last year of high school, skipped the last Friday before the exam break, and was unaware that they had changed the exam schedule that they had released at the beginning of the week. Walked in for what I thought was an afternoon history exam, only to find out that the history exam had been moved to the morning, and my math exam, which I was completely unprepared for, had been moved to the afternoon. I failed the history exam because I wasn't there, and then failed the math exam because I suck at math. A similar thing happened to me with a vastly different outcome. I had a twice a week class that I hated the professor for. She just read straight from PowerPoints and added no additional information to them. Needless to say, I never showed up. Well, turns out that during one of those classes, she made the decision to give the final during the last class period, instead of during finals week during the allotted time slash location specified for the final exam. When I showed up at that location at the time specified, no one was there. I missed the final. This was a class only offered during one semester. I thought with certainty I'd have to spend another year at school. I showed up during her office hours to explain and apparently based on school policies, she could offer the final early but was still required to give the option of taking it during the allotted time. Since I could prove I was there and she wasn't, she was in just as much crap as I was. She gave me the average score on my first two tests and we moved on and never talked about it again. Story 5. Bring on a sleazy business partner whose shenanigans put me under. Even 25 years later, if he stepped in front of my car, I wouldn't even think of tapping the brakes. Dealing with this now, it's brutal. He's embezzled almost a million dollars. I feel you. That's even worse than my story. Mine didn't do that. He just started a side business without telling me until it was too late. He'd already signed the lease and was on the hook for hundreds of thousands. I pointed out, because we were a subchapter S, his credit affected the credit of the company. The guy's antique dealership closed a year later. When I asked if he resolved all of his credit issues, he said all cleared up and I was a big enough idiot to believe him. What he didn't tell me was that he had declared bankruptcy and was interviewing for a job out of town. He literally got up in the middle of our second largest client's strategic planning meeting and never came back. Three months later, when I was about to tap into what had been my pristine credit to buy out his stock, I was told by the bank that we had filed for bankruptcy. After all, if one shareholder files, then the company is bankrupt. News to me, as a result, I couldn't borrow a dime. He never told me a thing about it. Because my company's credit was now screwed up beyond recognition, it absolutely destroyed my vendor relationships. I couldn't do anything. I had to fold and file bankruptcy myself. This with a business that I had spent eight years building into $5 million in annual sales. Poof, gone. Mind you, I made big mistakes in how I handled it. The minute I found out he had opened a side business, I should have given him the option of shutting down that side gig or forfeiting his shares of stock, but I was kind of naive and trusting. I feel you. I started a business in 2012 with a business partner. Around 2014, I caught on to his shenanigans. By 2015, I chased him out on the advice of a business attorney, and that business attorney gave me three potential paths he might take so that we were prepared. The idiot was an idiot and took the path of least resistance, to the point he didn't even come knocking for his 50% share. We liquidated the business, and I started a new LLC and poached all of our clients. I've been going strong for nine years. Lesson learned, always consult a business attorney. 
Same. I married her. Imagine how you'd feel if you got your crap together, called your lawyer to execute your escape clause, and were told, this is family law, not contract law, your evidence doesn't matter. Then I had to pay for her lawyer, which did nothing to encourage dissolving the marriage quickly or cheaply. After I was 500k in, they actually asked for 400k in cash because that's what they were going to make going to court. This happened to my dad years ago. Dad died a few years after and lost everything. Life insurance, retirement funds, investments in the bankruptcy. And couldn't leave anything for us. Mom is still a struggling parent. When I got a call a few years ago that my dad's friend died, and I was the closest person to notify, I guess, I just said that's nice and hung up. Told my mom about it and she said good riddance. Story 6. Not watching a movie with my dad before he died from cancer. My dad was months into his chemo treatments at this point, and he just asked me one day if I wanted to watch some old movies with him for a bit. I declined and said I needed to work on school stuff. I was living at home at the time, and I was talking about 15 hours of classes. So I was generally busy, but not then. It tore me apart to see my dad that way. The drugs had been rough on him, and it pained me to see him like that. My dad passed maybe a month or two later, and it is still to this day my biggest regret. We both loved movies, and I would give anything to go back and watch anything with him. I still randomly have moments of despair thinking about it, and I know he would not want me to continue beating myself up, but it's hard. Don't have regrets like me. Spend those precious moments with your loved ones. The beautiful thing about having loving parents is that they generally understand that their kids might be too busy for something. I know it probably doesn't make it any easier to cope with, but in similar instances, I've reminded myself that I was doing the best I could at the time. I don't know him, and I don't know you, but your dad probably understood that you were swamped with work, and I'd bet he'd want to see you succeed more than anything. However, I can guarantee he was just as grateful for all the other times you were able to spend together. This one connects with me. My mother died of a sudden heart attack in 2020, at the age of 64. I was supposed to have dinner with her the day before, but canceled due to some BS reason. Laziness, basically. We had a good relationship and I saw her regularly, but this is still my biggest regret. One of our, humans, greatest weaknesses is complacency. Whether it's a friendship, romantic relationship, or a family member, you'll miss them when they're gone. And you'll never know when it'll end, how or when. A few years ago, I visited my aunt who lives five hours away. She lived by the coast and growing up, she taught me all sorts of water-based activities like sailing, kayaking, surfing, and water skiing. In my adult years, we didn't get to do that sort of stuff much anymore. But this trip, we went kayaking together somewhere I'd never been. The weather was really good, but the sea was unbelievably clear. We could see fish, jellyfish, crabs, all sorts. We kayaked around the cliffs into caves, around an island, and across the beach before heading back into the harbor. It was an absolutely magical experience. A few months after that, she got sudden brain cancer, and the last time I saw her, she couldn't speak, let alone kayak. But I'm so thankful that we were able to have that last trip together. I'll treasure that memory. Anyway, I need to go cry now. I, who has bowel cancer, spent the last three weeks of my mum's, who had brain cancer, life, stuck in the hospital. And even though I know that wasn't my fault and couldn't be helped, I still feel so sad and guilty for not being there with her. After she got diagnosed, I became her full-time carer and spent every waking second with her until I got sick myself. I would do anything to go back and have that time with her, and I hate that I wasn't there for her at the end. Cancer is a cunt. My grandpa turned to alcohol to deal with the insane amount of pain that he was always in. He had heart issues already and had briefly gone back to work after a bovine valve replacement, but took another leave of absence shortly after returning. He worked for a Honda manufacturing plant at the time and had for a few decades. And I think he only lasted one day back on the job. He wasn't regularly taking his anticoagulants. The last time I saw him, I was just so mad at him for letting himself go. He was cranky all the time, always drunk, and had a massive beer gut. He wasn't the grandpa I knew and loved, who had helped to raise me when my own crappy mother chose to party over me. I was only 14 and didn't understand anything he was going through. He died only a couple of weeks later of another heart attack at the age of 62. 
I just wish I'd shown him empathy. I didn't even hug him goodbye that time. He died thinking I viewed him as a disappointment, when the reality was that he was the only real father figure I ever had. Eventually, I changed my last name to his to honor his memory, before I got married and it changed again. Story 7. Quitting college to take a management position at my fast food job. I almost did this. Was working fast food as a shift manager and going to a nearby community college in the early 2000s. Our store manager had just quit and they were looking to replace them. There were two options. One guy who was already the assistant manager wanting to make me his assistant when he was store manager. This meant a salaried job making about 45 to 55k a year. Again, early 2000s. The other guy was a guy from another store who wanted to bring in his own people. They ended up bringing in the guy from the other store. That guy proceeded to fire every single shift manager except one and bring in all of his friends to work the restaurant, myself included. I ended up fired. I can say this with hindsight, one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life. It motivated me to get off my ass and go away to college get the campus experience where I met my now wife. Fun postscript, the one manager they kept was a buddy of mine who we always jokingly called a McLifer. He still works for the company, just at a different store. When I went home for a holiday break around 2010 or so, I saw the manager who fired me and he was stocking shelves at the local Walmart. That's what prompted me to contact my old buddy and ask if he knew anything, and he laid out the story for me. The guy who fired me and brought in all his friends ended up being fired himself when he was caught stealing cash at the end of the night. He and his friends would underring customers, miscount drawers, blame others for the error. This is how he got three people fired and just generally do their best to rob the place blind. Apparently this lasted for three years. Eventually he got caught when they installed new security cameras. Apparently, the stores constantly having miscounted drawers caused the corporation to install cameras on every single register and the manager's desk. The store manager somehow didn't know they actively recorded and kept the footage for 48 hours. He thought they could only see live shots. He was apparently telling his friends that they could still do what they did because corporations weren't going to pay someone to watch the cameras all day every day. When a drawer was short $150, he of course blamed the cashier he wanted to fire corporate came in and said they'd review the footage. According to my buddy, the manager turned white and realized he was screwed. Corporate reviewed the footage and saw him remove the cash himself. He was fired immediately, and a bunch of his friends quit with him in solidarity, saying he was framed. It was only $150 they could prove, so he wasn't prosecuted for it. Story 8. Trying heroin. Spent six years chasing that dragon. I'm now five years clean, though, Okay, so I'm fighting addiction and I'm clean for less than a week, again. Somehow I'm able to keep my posture, but there's still nothing worse than feeling jittery all the time. All the best to you, buddy. You got this. Be endlessly proud of what you've achieved. Overcoming addiction is the worst. Way to go, bud. As someone who's been on methadone for over 15 years, I wonder if Vivitrol would work for me when I decide to come completely off. Do you know if it causes precipitated withdrawals? like Suboxone would. Stay strong. Story 9. I was freeballing, and I put on a pair of pants right after I took them out of the dryer. Burnt the tip of my pecker on a hot zipper. It hurt like hell. I remember in the fourth grade, my best friend, I'm female, he's male, was freeballing, and his fly was down. So I told him, and he tried to zip up. Poor guy caught the crown jewels in the zipper. It was stuck, and he couldn't get it unstuck. I watched in horror as he wrestled with it, rolling around on the floor crying as his face started to turn purple. The teacher stopped the lesson and had to escort him to the nurse's office. Story 10. I let go of someone who was really good for me because of chronic depression and insecurities, and now here I am alone because of it. I know that feeling. She was the kindest, smartest, and most motivated woman I've ever known. We dated when she moved to town for a summer internship before her senior year of college. We started out telling each other we were just hanging out, nothing serious since she was going to be moving to another state after graduation. We had a great summer and I ended up visiting her at school a few times in the fall. 
When the time came for her to move, we realized we'd both caught feelings for each other and confessed our love. She asked me to move with her, and I said I couldn't move that far away from my friends and family. But the truth was, I was afraid I'd hold her back from reaching her potential, and was afraid my anxiety and depression would end up destroying our relationship. That was 20-ish years ago, and I've regretted that decision ever since. I've yet to find a partner who has made me feel as cared for and loved as she did. I did that to a close friend when I was younger. She was the most upbeat, sincere person I had in my life. I was going through some horrible time in my early teens, and felt that I didn't want to drag her into it. I cut contact. I basically ran from everything just so that she didn't have to deal with the stuff in my life. And that's what ended up hurting her the most. I tried to be friends again later after meeting up and she was open to it, but I was still going through and apparently not ready to tell her anything that had happened and ended up slowly not talking because I felt ashamed. So didn't learn my lesson and it collapsed. Years later, I was ready and she didn't even want to talk to me. I don't blame her at all, and I wish her the best. But it was all born out of a childish misunderstanding of so much around me. I know it wasn't really my fault, but it still doesn't fix the giant hole I left in my heart. And I wish I could have been someone she relied on instead of letting her down. Story 11. When I was a kid, we used to ride our bikes to the top of a hill and pedal as fast as we could down to the beginning of a sidewalk that was pushed up by tree roots and we would hit super sick jumps off of them. No helmet. My bike's front wheel and handlebars became loose from the abuse, and when I landed, my handles were straight, but the wheel sent me right into a tree. Went over the handlebars head first and hit the tree. Knocked out cold. From what people tell me, my personality changed, as did my penmanship, grades, and everything. We had the same setup in front of our house when I was young. All the daredevils in the neighborhood would speed down the hill on their bikes and big wheels, launch over the buckled up sidewalk and end up crashing. My poor mom had to bandage and comfort many children in those days. Her dream was for the town to remove the damn tree and fix the sidewalk. It's subject to debate whether it was the trauma from all the crashes or his dad's alcohol abuse that messed up the neighbor's kid. Similar story here, my wheel came loose after a family vacation. I was 12 or 13 and tried to tighten it myself. Thought I did and went to ride my bike. I always tried to bunny hop my mountain bike over this hump in the road. Never could do it, until this one fateful day. I got massive air. Then it was time to land, so I stood up on my pedals and started to prepare when I saw my front tire roll past me. I chipped my front tooth and had a pretty gnarly lip scar. Then, 15 years later, the other front tooth caught an infection related to the damage it received during the fall, and I had to have it removed, like three months before my wedding. Fun times! Thanks for watching until the end. If you have a similar story to these that you would like to share with us, please leave it in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please leave us a like and subscribe. For more videos like this one right now, please stop by our channel. Thanks again, and see you next time.